Hello and welcome back guys to the Big Blue Purple channel. Recently I finished farming out all of my Shadowbringers Gwib mounts for the super ultra awesome mecha Gwib and I wanted to talk about what the general experience was like of doing this as of patch 6.4 in 2023. I figure a lot of people still don't have this mount because they haven't gone out of their way to farm these extremes and they might be wondering you know like how difficult actually is it to farm these old extremes like is there still mechanics I need to worry about that I need to watch guides before I go into this yada yada yada. Um, and then this video, I just want to kind of demystify what it's like getting this mecha Gwib because it is way, way easier than you might think. So first of all, if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about right now, essentially each of the seven Shadowbringers Extreme Trials drop a Gwib mount. It's like a little dragon. Um, the only one that doesn't drop one is Memoria Mazera, which is the eighth extreme. That one doesn't drop a mount, so you can ignore that one. The other seven do. Once you get all seven Gwibs, you can go do a side quest which unlocks you this Mega Gwib. This is the same as all the previous expansions where once you collect all the Extreme Trial Mounts, you can get the Mega Extreme Trial Mount at the end. So basically, I'm just going to take you through each Extreme in the order that I farm them in and talk about what it's like to farm, what you need to know for it, and overall what you can expect just joining PF groups to farm out this mount. So the first of the extremes that I decided to farm was Crown of the Immaculate, or Innocence. Uh, I just joined this one first because it was the first party I saw when I decided to start grinding these out. This is without a doubt the easiest of all of the Shadowbringers trials to farm. Uh, it dies in like a minute and a half or less if your group has good damage. None of the mechanics are lethal, and all the mechanics that are in this fight are as simple as like pointing a tether away from your team or not standing in the orange because it's dangerous. Seriously, if you want the Gwib from this fight and you've never done it before, it's one of the easiest farms I've ever done in the entire game. There's no way to die, there's no way to wipe the group even if you tried to, um, and it's like a minute and a half tops uh, with some good damage. The other thing that's good about this one is that there's no like cutscene or downtime where the boss goes untargetable and you have to just like watch something. Uh, you just wail on him until he dies over and over again. Uh, and it's super straightforward like that. Whereas most of the other trials from Shadowbringers unfortunately have a lot of downtime which makes farming them really tedious. As for my own personal experience farming this one, I have pretty much nothing to talk about it because I got the Gwib in like 7 runs and was done with it. So yeah, I mean, even if you had to 99 this one, which granted would still suck, this is definitely one of the least bad ones to have to 99. And of course by 99 if you don't know, I mean having to clear the fight 99 times to get 99 totems, which you can then exchange for the mount at an NPC if you are too unlucky to actually just roll them out yourself. The only real downside of farming this fight, uh, as opposed to some of the other ones, is that the crafting material sells for absolutely nothing. Um, it's called like the Immaculate Wing Blade, I think, and it sells for like 2,000 gil on my server or something, so it's totally not worth grinding for the crafting material, where some of the other ones, like Hades, have a crafting material that sells for a million gil. The next Gwib I ended up farming for was Titania's Gwib in the Dancing Plague Extreme. This one was just as easy as Innocence pretty much with a couple of mechanics I guess you should know. I say that because basically the only thing you need to know is that if your group's damage is decent but not great, you need to hold damage at 25% until she puts the lightning tether on somebody. The reason you need to do this is if you don't hold DPS at 25% of her HP, it'll just skip you right to the adds phase and then you'll lose like 30 seconds of time because you have to do the adds phase and you can't just kill her. The only like mechanic in this fight I guess are these water puddles she spawns. You just need one player in each puddle. Um, I was doing this with an undersized party in the footage you're seeing so you'll see what happens when the puddles don't get soaked. Basically it just spawns an ad and you just need to kill the ad, it's really not a big deal. Because we're unrestricted, we're doing so much damage anyway that these ads are completely inconsequential. Uh, otherwise, there's light party stacks you're supposed to do in these water um, puddles. But again, our health bars are so high, I think you can just eat these stacks solo at this point and it doesn't matter. So, while there are technically mechanics, you don't need to do them to farm the fight, is what I'm saying. 
Something to note is that you might skip these water puddles entirely if your damage is good. I believe if you push her past 54% or something around there, uh, before she casts the water puddle, you'll just skip right into the phase you're seeing now with like the grass and shit on the, on the rooftop. If you do end up skipping the water puddles phase and you have a good damage group, then you, you can disregard everything I said earlier about holding DPS at 25%. That should really not matter if your group has decent gear and you're pushing her past water phase. This fight will really just vary from party to party, but it's incredibly easy no matter which party you have. If you have a bit of a lower damage party, then you may need to hold DPS, but if you have a really high damage party, you'll be able to completely skip um, all of that holding bullshit and all the mechanics. As for my own personal experience farming this one, it was actually really, really good. I joined a group that just decided to stay in the instance and just grind the instance until everyone who needed the mount got the mount and then we disbanded. So. I didn't have to worry about people looting scooting or I didn't have to worry about like losing on the mount rolls because I knew eventually I would get it no matter what. And I was actually the seventh person in the group to get the mount and then my friend was the eighth, which was pretty funny. So we both uh, got our mounts last. But yeah, if you can find a group like that, that's definitely a good way to do it. It'll just guarantee you get your mount and you can get out of there and you'll be done. And the one other good thing about this trial to keep in mind in comparison to the other ones is that it drops a crafting material, the dancing wing which sells for like 500k gil on the market board. The next trial I decided to farm was Ruby Weapon. Um, this one is once again pretty quick, and it does have the benefit of dropping a crafting material just like Titania, which will sell for around 500k gil. Just like the last two fights, this one is super easy to farm, but the one thing that makes it much more tedious than the last two is the unskippable cutscene smack in the middle. And despite the fact that there's an unskippable cutscene in this fight, it still only drops one totem. So if you have terrible luck in this fight, you still need to do it 99 times. Yeah, have fun watching that cutscene 99 times if you get unlucky, man. Uh, mechanically speaking, in the first phase, this is really the only mechanic you need to do, which is these little spiral AoEs. These AoEs are going to go off in a spiral formation, and you just need to dodge them as best as you can. Uh, even if you fail to dodge them and you take some hits, it really doesn't fucking matter. You can, I think you can eat like three or four Vulnups here without dying, so it's not a huge deal. After we watch the unskippable cutscene, we hit a checkpoint. This is a checkpoint, so if you die here, you just start back here. Uh, it's not a huge deal. Um, as for the second phase, the only mechanic you need to know is that when the two adds spawn, you gotta look at your debuff, and if you have a red debuff, you hit the blue add, and if you have a blue debuff, you hit the red add. But yeah, that's like everything you need to know about this fight. It's super easy to farm. It's a good one to farm because it drops the crafting material, like I said. And out of all the Shadowbringers trials with a cutscene in it, this is the least tedious of them all to farm, in my opinion. As for my personal experience, I got my mount within, I think, just 15 runs of this trial. So I didn't have to spend too much time here. I got pretty lucky. And after this is when my luck ran out. The fourth extreme trial that I decided to farm was the Diamond Weapon, or the Cloud Deck Extreme. Despite the horrible RNG I got farming this fight, I think this is probably the best overall farming experience because it drops two totems and it only takes like two minutes per kill. This meant that despite my horrible luck in not getting the mount to drop, I only had to do this one 50 times to just buy the mount with totems. While this fight does drop a crafting material, it's not really worth much now because we don't have anything that uses that crafting material outside, I believe, a barding. As for mechanics in this fight, it's super, super light on mechanics, just like the last three that we talked about. Um, the only thing that you could actually potentially kill people with are the spreads. Essentially, if the boss's shoulders open up when he's like telegraphing an attack, that means that he's going to do a big spread and that all eight players need to be away from each other when that goes off. Otherwise, if the laser opens up on his chest, that just means it's going to be a stack marker and everyone will stack in the middle. Otherwise, most of the mechanics here are just the same as they are in normal mode or we just resolve them the same way as normal mode. Uh, if the boss's claw starts glowing towards your side of the arena, that means you need to switch sides because he's going to cleave that entire side of the arena. The other thing to keep note of is be careful with how often you use those teleport pads because you have, I believe, a 15 second debuff that prevents you from using them again. 
Uh, so make sure you're not just using them whenever you want, only use them when it is necessary to dodge a mechanic. Otherwise, for this fight, I recommend bringing one tank, one healer. You really don't need two tanks. You see two tanks in the footage we have here, but you could basically have a DPS be the second tank, and as long as the healer is paying attention to that DPS, it really won't matter, and you'll kill the boss even faster that way. The reason I say you want one healer for this fight, whereas for the last three we talked about, you don't need a healer at all, uh, is mainly just because of the raid-wide damage that comes out. It can actually be pretty fucking high. And if you are running only one tank, then you definitely need a healer. This one has a nice rhythm to it once you get the farm down. It's just lots of switching back and forth between the platforms and doing either stacks or spreads or nothing because sometimes he just does diamond rain, which is an AoE. And I believe normally you would resolve this by going into light parties, but because our health is so high, we can all just take the spread on one platform. One thing to note for this fight is that the variance you may experience in mechanics uh, is very different with every group depending on how much damage people deal. If you're in a good damage group, you're not going to see anything. You're just going to see this one first phase where you do stacks and spreads and stuff and you'll kill the boss during your two minute burst is usually what happens. If you have a group with uh, a little bit less than great damage, then you're going to end up seeing one more mechanic when he transforms into the dog with these tethers and these knockbacks. Basically, if you have a short tether, you're going to get knocked to the opposite platform, and if you have a long tether, you're going to get knocked on the same platform. As you're seeing here in the footage, I have a long tether, so I line myself up like this, get knocked onto the same platform, and everyone with the short tether got knocked to the opposite side to stretch out their tether, and then you just got to move away from the side that the boss is cleaving. Uh, and that should be all the mechanics you need to see or know for this fight. You should skip that mechanic most of the time anyway. In this run in specific, we had a lot of deaths to people messing up spreads or whatever, so I was able to actually showcase that in the video. That's what that mechanic looks like, just in case you see it. But yeah, that's pretty much everything you should know for Diamond Weapon. It's really, really straightforward. Probably one of the most painless to farm because it drops two totems. And it's kind of fun, honestly, uh, as an unsync. Like, there's only a couple mechanics going out, but they're kind of fun to do, the stacks and the spreads and the switching sides. I just like this fight. I think it's really cool. In terms of my own personal experience with this one and luck, I got pretty unlucky. Like I said, I had to do this one the whole 50 times to get all the totems. But out of all the trials to get unlucky on, this one isn't too, too bad. Especially in comparison to the trial we're going to talk about now. The Emerald Weapon was the fifth Gwib I decided to farm, and little did I know that this would be my own personal hell for two days of just non-stop farming before I finally got this Gwib after collecting 76 totems. So hey, at least I didn't have to get all 99, right? There's a few things that make this one a lot more annoying to farm than the other ones we've talked about so far. First of all, this is the first extreme trial out of all of them that actually has a mechanic that can wipe the whole party if it's not done correctly. This means that everyone in your party needs to at least have one brain cell handy to know how to soak orbs at the right time. So at the beginning of the fight, you're going to assign everyone partners and then assign each of those partner groups a cardinal direction. I was north with the black mage here because I was the main tank. When the orbs spawn, you soak the one in your cardinal direction, and then you're either going to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. In this case, it was counterclockwise, because one of the other groups needed to go counterclockwise to collect the right color. What trips people up a lot here is they think you just pick a rotation order. Like, they think you just say clockwise and then go clockwise every time. But it changes depending on what order the orbs spawn in, so you need to actually keep your eyes peeled and make sure you're doing it right. The threat of this mechanic is that if someone doesn't soak an orb, that orb will detonate and just wipe the whole party. It does 9999 damage. This mechanic alone makes this trial already really annoying to farm when you have that one party member who can't wrap their head around soaking orbs. Generally, it's not too bad, and most of the groups I was in were able to do the mechanic just fine, but those few groups that can't do it really stick out in your mind and just really frustrate you. The other thing that makes this fight really annoying to farm is this unskippable cutscene you have to watch every single pull. Yes, I had to watch this 76 times or however many totems I got, and it was wonderful. Also, I don't know who on Square Enix's dev team was smoking crack when they decided to make this drop one totem and Diamond Weapon drop two totems. I just, I actually cannot fathom why this should only drop one when it has an unskippable cutscene and takes twice as long as Diamond Weapon. Even when the content was current, I imagine that this fight would still take longer than Diamond Weapon did when that was current. 
If I'm mistaken, please let me know in the comments below. But just looking at the two fights, I'd imagine this one still took longer when it was current than Diamond Weapon took. After the cutscene, you get a checkpoint, just like Ruby Weapon. Um, the only mechanic in this phase you really need to worry about are the blue line AoEs everybody gets under them. We put markers around the corner of the arena to show everyone exactly where they need to stand so there is no confusion. As you can see in this footage, you basically line up the back of your arrow with whatever marker it corresponds to, and then nobody will get hit or kill each other. If you don't put the markers down, there is always some shenanigans that goes on here of people just like assassinating each other across the screen with those. Otherwise, there's this weird set of AoEs you need to dodge, which are like kind of crosses and X's that he puts these swords down for. Um, honestly, you don't really need to dodge these at all. You can kind of just eat them all and still live. I think you can eat two of them, but if you eat a third one, you die or something along those lines. So you don't actually need to understand how to dodge it. You just need to know how to not get hit by all three hits. In a good damage group, the boss should just die right here, and you shouldn't see the other phase of the fight with the Gaius clone. But if you are unfortunate enough to get a lower damage group, then you will need to do that extra little Gaius phase, and that is like a one minute time loss. Just to show you what that mechanic might look like, the boss will go untargetable, the Gaius clone will spawn, and then you're just going to wail on him for a while. Make sure you do as much damage as you can to this clone because the damage transfers over to the boss at the end. And a lot of the times the boss will just drop dead after this phase ends. Otherwise, uh, you'll just look to the side here and look at these numbers. That'll be the order that these Exaflares go off. So you're just going to dodge from like 5 to 2 or 3 to 1 or something like that. And then you're going to stack up in this little marker here. And you're going to want to press your anti-knockback because this is a knockback. You can also just eat the knockback perfectly fine and live as long as you angle yourself correctly. And then after that, the boss will come back targetable and just die instantly. Honestly, if it weren't for people griefing on orbs and the unskippable cutscene, this one would be pretty fun to farm. But it just gets so tedious, and I mean, I was so fed up with this fight by the time I finally got the mount. I feel so sorry for anyone out there who had to get all 99 from this fight. This is probably the worst one to farm out of all of them. It's just so annoying. The crafting mat also isn't worth anything yet because we don't have any weapons that use it yet, and it's only for a barding, I believe. So right now, uh, just stock up on the mat, but probably don't sell it until we get crafted weapons. Hopefully next patch, because we didn't get any crafted weapons this patch for whatever reason, but that's a whole other topic. After Emerald Weapon, I decided to try Hades. Hades is a bit of a weird one, where technically it is the longest running trial of all of the Shadowbringers ones. It takes around 5 minutes with all of the cutscenes and downtime you have to put up with. This fight has more downtime and longer cutscenes than any of the other fights, but thankfully it also drops 2 totems per run. It also drops a crafting material that sells for an absurd amount of gil, like we're talking like nearly a million gil for the Hades Aura site. This benefits you in more than one way as a Gwib farmer. The main reason is that you can also make gil while you're farming the Gwib, of course, but the other thing is that if you put up a farm party for something like Hades, and you say mat slash mount farm, you might get four or five people who join that already have the mount, and they just want to get the material and then you're fighting for way less people over the mount. This is exactly what happened to me. Four people in my Hades farm party had already gotten the mount, and four of us still needed it. I was fortunate enough to get my mount within 14 runs of this fight. If you aren't fortunate enough to get a party like that for Hades, doing this one 50 times for all the totems will definitely take a long time. There's a lot of downtime, there's a lot of cutscenes, and you can't really do anything to speed this one up, as it's going to be around 5 minutes no matter what you do. In terms of actual mechanics or knowledge you need to have of this fight, there's barely anything. If you're a tank, you need to soak these meteors that spawn in each phase of the fight, and then the DPS need to take these tethers and point them away from the tanks who are soaking meteors. If you hit the tank who's soaking a meteor uh, with your tether, they're going to die to the damage from that meteor. Basically the way I do this is I watch the tank soak their first meteor and then I point the tether at where that first meteor was. For the Laha Brea phase here, this is exactly the same as the ruby weapon adds, where you'll need to hit the boss that corresponds with your debuff. In this case I had the fire debuff, so I needed to hit the ice add. If you have the ice debuff, you need to hit the fire add. 
for this Asian Prime phase, you should just kill him before he does anything, like before any of the mechanics actually go off. The only thing that needs to happen is the healers need to make sure they top everyone off after Universal Manipulation is cast, because it is a doom and people will die. That is the reason you need uh, one healer for this fight no matter what, and you do need two tanks for this fight because of the meteors that spawn, so you will need two tanks and one healer. When the boss finally becomes targetable again, this phase is extremely straightforward. Tanks will just soak meteors and everyone else will do effectively nothing. One person will get an AoE they have to take away from the party and that is it. Um, and then once the boss is low enough, you will trigger another cutscene. The final phase of this fight is literally just Exaflares and nothing else, so if you've dodged Exaflares before, you already know how to do this. So yeah, this is a super simple fight. You don't really need to look up anything or like learn anything about the fight before you come in. If you're a tank, just make sure you know which meteors you're soaking, either south or north. And uh, if you're a DPS, then you get to do nothing the whole fight and just hit the boss. This one would not be as long as it is if it weren't for just all the unnecessary downtime that is constantly happening during this fight. There's like a cutscene or dialogue between every single phase of this fight, and there's like five phases in this fight. So it can be pretty annoying to farm, but it's also one of those trials where you barely need to be paying attention and you can kind of just be watching something on your other screen the whole time. Uh, and there's nothing, there's no mechanics that you can really kill the party with, you know. After getting my Gwib from Hades, I moved on to my seventh and final trial, the Warrior of Light. Seat of Sacrifice was the last extreme trial I ended up farming. Um, this one is kind of similar to Emerald Weapon, I would say, in the sense where there's one mechanic everyone needs to do right, and as long as everyone can do that one mechanic, it's free. For this fight, you do actually need two tanks and two healers because of the way the meteor mechanic works, which is that one mechanic that I'm talking about. Also, the boss starts with a raid wide that puts everyone down to one HP, so you're going to need healers to heal that. He'll do a Solemn Confidier, which is a AoE that just spawns underneath everyone, so you can just stack up to bait that. It doesn't even matter if you fuck it up because it does no damage. There's also these Protean spreads, which we can do correctly or not. It really doesn't matter if you don't do those spreads correctly. Limit Break here is the mechanic that matters. This is the Meteors. So go to the corner with your partner. This is my partner here. We soak the Meteors, and then we move back to the middle. And that's basically it. Uh, after that, the fight is pretty much free. You need to tank LB at the right time as usual, but the game will give that to you. Otherwise, for these imbued saber attacks here, you should be able to skip all of these entirely if you have enough damage. He'll just go straight into the adds phase, I believe if you push him past uh, 50%. For the adds, we just split up into light parties here. Uh, so I was on the left side, and so I hit the left add. Um, no mechanics to speak of during this adds phase, just shit out as much damage as you can onto the adds so that you skip all of the mechanics that would happen. Just ignore the flares. Uh, even if you do stand in the party and your flare goes off, it doesn't do enough damage to like be lethal to anyone, so you don't need to move away with the flares. Um, and then at this point here, you just have to LB3 once he casts his LB, and that's pretty much the whole fight. I think there's like three different mechanics he could do in this second phase, but all of them are completely trivial and you can ignore what he's doing if your damage is good enough. You'll just end up skipping like all of the mechanics and killing the boss in about three minutes every run. This one takes about three minutes per run. It drops one totem. It doesn't have a cutscene, so it's not too, too bad to farm, but the LB3 does kind of act as a cutscene in a sense. This one took 33 runs for me to get my mount, which wasn't too bad. Farming this one can be a bit of a shit show depending on the party you get. Yeah, all you need to do is, is soak those meteors in the corners like I showed earlier. That's the only thing that can cause wipes. But people fuck that up sometimes and it's just it's just tragic. So make sure that before you pull the boss, when you first zone in with a new party, that you assign your spots so that doesn't happen. One other thing to note is not to use melee LB1 or any kind of DPS LB1. By the end of the fight, you'll have LB1 ready, but if you use it, the boss will become invulnerable for like 30 seconds after you use it. So do not use the LB, it'll slow this farm down for everyone. Just hit the boss with your normal attacks and ignore the LB1 that you have. Out of all seven of them, this one is probably the most difficult, I guess? Not that any of these are difficult at all, like anyone can totally do this. It's just like, 
you need to actually do a mechanic in this one or you'll kill someone Sim similar to emerald weapon so i guess this and emerald weapon are probably about the same difficulty you know but all in all that's all the trials and all the gwibs that you'll need to farm and a rundown of what all of it will look like and, and what my experience with it was hopefully you found this helpful if you're looking to farm gwibs yourself and you haven't started yet or hopefully this gave you the motivation to go finish off those last couple of gwibs that you haven't gotten yet if you haven't started farming these gwibs yet and you're a little nervous because maybe you've never done an extreme or something before and it sounds scary, I encourage you to just go join like an Innocence or a Titania party because you'll see really, really quickly that it's incredibly easy to farm these and there's nothing you need to worry about. If you're someone who's already got all your gwibs, um, let me know in the comments below which one took you the longest to get, which one were you unfortunate enough to have to 99, were you so unlucky that you had to 99 like five of them or all seven of them or you know, let me know in the comments. I would love to hear. And if you're someone who farmed these back when the content was actually current, I'd be curious to know which one was the most annoying to farm. Were the ones with the cutscenes still the most annoying, or was Diamond actually hard to farm back in the day or something? Anyways, thank you all for watching. That's going to do it for this one. Remember to like the video, but only if you did. And subscribe to the Big Blue Purple channel if you're not already. I make near-weekly Final Fantasy XIV content, so if you're interested and what I'm doing in this game or what I have to say about this game, then consider subscribing. Anyways, thanks for watching, and get out there and farm yourself some goddamn gwibs.